Mark Anthony was known as the silver-throated orator of Rome. He had everything going for him. He was a brilliant statesman. He was magnificent in battle. He was courageous and strong. And on top of that, he was handsome. As far as personal qualities are concerned, he had everything it takes to become a world ruler of his day. But he had a very vulnerable and fatal flaw of moral weakness. So much so that on one occasion, his personal tutor looked him in the face and shouted, Marcus, oh Marcus, colossal child, able to conquer the world, but unable to resist a temptation. Mark Anthony is not the only one who has struggled to resist temptation. In fact, our topic today is something relevant to every single person in the room, everybody watching online, because all of us struggle with temptation. My title is Facing Temptation. Last week, we began a new series, and I love it when we're in a verse-by-verse -verse series, and we're in this little book that was originally a letter to churches called James, written by not one of the disciples of Jesus named James, there were two, but by the brother of Jesus, the half-brother, the younger brother of Jesus, who had not believed in Jesus during his earthly ministry, unfortunately, but had a dramatic conversion after Jesus appeared to him after the resurrection. And he became all in as a follower of Jesus, so much so that he became the much-respected leader of the church in Jerusalem, for about 30 years until he was martyred for his faith. And he's writing to Christians who are scattered everywhere, mostly because of persecution. And he's writing very specifically to believers. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, there's a lot of wisdom you can find to apply to your life here. But um, you will notice he's not telling so much how to be saved. And we have that elsewhere, especially in Paul's writings. But he's telling more about after you're a follower of Jesus, how to live it out, how to walk it out, how to become mature, how to grow up in your faith. And we'll see a theme of, of the emphasis on being doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Now, last week, we looked at how God can use trials in our life to grow our faith, to build our character. And I found a picture that illustrates uh, very well the message of last week, I think. The top, <coughs> your plan. You set a goal, no problem. That's where I'm going. But sometimes God's plan looks a little different, doesn't it? There might be some uphills and some downhills and some obstacles and some bridges and some water crossings and some storms. And through it all, God is working, if you cooperate with him, to build character, to bring you toward maturity. It sometimes, unfortunately, happens more in trials than it does in, in the easy times. James 1, 2 to 4, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials because the testing of your faith produces endurance so that you may be lacking in nothing so that you can grow up, you can become mature as a follower of Jesus. Now, James does a shift here. And instead of talking about trials, which come from outside of us, he now shifts to talk about temptations, which come from inside of us. Trials, which often are that's things we just can't control and, or avoid. Temptation, on the other hand, something that we can resist in the power of God. James 1, we pick it up with verses 13 through 15, where we read, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has full grown, gives birth to death. What is temptation? I think we're all very aware of it. It's a seduction or a solicitation to do wrong. <clears throat> a glance at the dictionary will inform you that temptation is the act of enticement to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain. Many times, temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way, outside of God's will. For example, there are basic human desires that are not sinful because God gave them to us. They're not bad. They're God-given, like, like hunger and thirst and sleep and sex. The problem is when we seek to fulfill those desires outside of God's plan. Uh, eating is normal. Gluttony is sin. Drinking is normal. 
Drunkenness is sin. Sleep is normal. Laziness is sin. Sex is a gift from God, but only in the context of marriage. Now, in these verses we just read, we learn several things about temptation. If you like taking notes, there's an outline in your worship folder. You can write these down. Number one, temptation is inevitable. The text begins by saying, when tempted. Everyone is tempted. It's not if, it's when. Jesus gave his disciples a sample prayer to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And in it, there, was this line that, there is this line that says, lead us not into temptation. Now, I think what it's saying is we should avoid tempting situations to safeguard ourselves. But it's not saying that we can fully avoid temptation. Because as we read elsewhere, we live in a fallen, broken world where it is inevitable that we will face temptation. One thing we all have in common, by the way, <laughs> every last one of us, rich, poor, young, old, businessman, or stay-at-home mother, you might live in the city, you might live in the country, you might live on a deserted island, and you're the only one there. Nevertheless, we're all tempted. You see, you can't get completely away from temptation because you take it with you in your mind and your thoughts. That's where it begins. That's where it starts. And if we want to become mature spiritually, you know, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I'm so glad you're here and I hope that soon you will be. But for those of us who are, our goal is to become more like him, to grow up and to not stay babies, but to, to grow up to be mature. And if that's the case, then we've got to learn how to face temptation because it's never going away until Jesus comes back and restores all things. Second, temptation is never from God. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God works, as we saw last week, in our trials. It's the enemy that works in a temptation. God tests, but never tempts. Now, one thing I've noticed is that ever since the beginning of the story in the first few chapters, when sin entered, it's been a human tendency to blame someone else when we stumble or fall or sin. It started with Adam and Eve. After they rebelled against God, what did they do? They started blaming and shifting responsibilities. What happened? Adam says, it's Eve's fault. And Eve said, it's that talking serpent's fault. And what were they really saying? Adam was saying, that woman you gave me. <laughs> God, it's your fault. You gave me that woman. And she said, that serpent you made, God, it's your fault. You made it. And, and this is human tendency that continues. But James says we must never blame God for temptation to evil because it is contrary to who he is, to his nature. He cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, that may, be, that may seem obvious to those of you who have read the Bible and you've learned something about the holiness of God. But consider, James writing initially to first century Christians who... Um, have uh, uh, paganism all around them, and he is specifically contradicting the pagan notion of that day. If you've studied anything about mythology, you know the so-called gods of Greek and Roman mythology were a mixture of good and evil. They were fickle and temperamental and could be actually tempters, not with the true, the one true God of heaven and earth. The ruler of the universe does not traffic in the realm of immoral. In fact, Next week, we'll see verse 17 says, God is only good all the time. So, where does temptation come to? God is not the author of solicitations towards sin. Where does it come from? Three sources the Bible speaks of. Number one, most obviously, is the devil. The devil's real. And when sin first entered God's creation, the tempter was the devil disguising himself through a talking ser serpent. Now, we read elsewhere that Satan and his evil angels were originally holy angels who rebelled against God, were banished from heaven. Demons are fallen angels who will someday be cast into the lake of fire and destroyed, and they know it, so they are angry, and they know their time is limited, so they are bent on causing as much evil as possible. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, the devil began an attack on him that would be a sustained attack, seeking to thwart his purposes till the very end, but he pulled out all the stops in the wilderness when Jesus went for a season of prayer and fasting, and he came hard against him in Matthew chapter 4. 
In chapter 4, verse 1, it says, it says Jesus was tempted by the devil. And then later in verse 3, the devil is called the tempter. That's what he is. He's a tempter. Secondly is the world. Now, when I say temptation comes from the world, I'm not talking about, there's, there's different definitions of world. I'm not talking about the planet we live on that, you know, we get these beautiful pictures from the astronauts up. God loves this world. He created it. He said it was very good. Even though it's been impacted by sin, he wants us to continue to be caretakers of it. Neither are we talking about the people in the world. In fact, in John 3.16, God says, God so loved the world that he sent his son. So we're not talking about the planet. We're not talking about the people. What we're talking about when we say temptation comes from the world is the system or philosophy of the world that is opposed to God's purposes. That's why 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world. And Romans 12.2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When it says the pattern of this world, it's talking about the system, the philosophy that is opposed to God. And if you're seeking to follow Jesus, then you are progressively developing a value system that is very different from the worldly system around you. So there's going to be ongoing, constant temptations that, that you've got to be on the watch for to recognize and to resist if you're indeed going to cooperate with the Lord to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and become more mature as opposed to the natural conformity to the ways of the world. So we've got the devil of the world and then the flesh. <clears throat> That's what the Bible calls our own fallen nature that is naturally, because of sin in the world, inclined towards selfishness. It's because of being born into a sinful world and because of the choices we've made to um, cooperate with the sinful, sinfulness that is really inside us. Now, when we come to faith in Jesus, something miraculous happens. The Bible says we are born again. It's described by Jesus in John 3. We're going to talk about it more next week because it talks about the new birth in verse 18, which couldn't be better timing because next week we're going to have a baptismal celebration. And when we have them here at Grace Place, it is a high occasion. You don't want to miss next week. By the way, if you're thinking about being baptized or you get convicted to be baptized, please let us know. We would like to put you on the list and prepare for that next week. But this, this thing about being born again is when you become a redeemed child of God, the Bible says you're a new creation. Something has changed in your nature. You have a new nature that is inclined to love and serve the Lord. Unfortunately, though, you don't get rid of your old nature yet. Until corrupt, this corruptible puts on incorruption. You don't get rid of that yet. Therefore, all of us who are followers of Jesus would admit, if we're honest, that we face an internal conflict many times. Because we have to decide constantly, will we follow the flesh or the spirit? Now, we've talked about three sources of temptation, and James talks about them all. In chapter 4, he gives us a warning Chapter 4, verse 4, that friendship with the world means enmity against God. And then in chapter 4, verse 7, he gives an exhortation to resist the devil. The world, the devil. But here in chapter 1, he's talking about the temptation that happens, quote, as a result of our own evil desire. That is, the flesh. Now notice number 3, temptation is not unique. But each person is tempted and we all have different weaknesses, and the, and the enemy knows that and customizes temptation. But listen, the basic categories of temptation are not unique. They are common to all mankind. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Therefore, do not ever think that you are alone in what you struggle with. Don't think, man, I got it worse off than anybody else because nobody's got this. No. You, you're, this is common. This is a common thing that we all go through. Even Jesus was tempted in the basic categories that are common to all humanity. Hebrews 4.15 says, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It's interesting to study the temptations of Jesus in Matthew 4 that I mentioned earlier. They kind of uh, fall into three major categories. They are pleasure, power, and possessions. And these are categories that are common temptations for all of us. Actually, those are God-given desires when they are, um, when we deal with them in the proper way. But, of course, the enemy always wants to 
distort our desires so that we will fulfill them contrary to God's will. Number four, I find this especially interesting. Temptation follows the same process. Verse 15, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Mark that word. It's important. Enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, I mentioned the word enticed. It is a vivid word in the Greek language, and it's a word that is used by fishermen to describe a lure or a bait. We got any fishermen here? We got some fishermen around here? Yeah, we got a few. You know, then, that a lure is meant to be alluring, right? That's the whole point. It, it, it's, it's made to, it's supposed to look tasty to a fish. And so that they will be unaware that the hook is there and go after it. Maybe it is tasty if it's a worm or a nightcrawler. I don't know. I've never tried one. But <laughs> they, they make these baits to look like something good. And, and the fish says, hmm, that looks interesting. Now, because of this word and how it describes the process of temptation, come on up here, Billy. I've got a fisherman here today because I don't know a lot about fishing. I've, I like to fish once in a while, and I, for me, fishing is usually, you know, put a worm on a hook and, with a bobber and throw it out and wait in a lake, you know. Maybe I get something, maybe I don't. But these guys that know what they're doing, like Billy Draper here, they are into it. They are seriously into it. This is Billy, and uh, he's been coming to Grace Place for a few months or something like that. Yep. Just moved up into this area. In fact, he's my neighbor. We've been in each other's house. His, his uh, wife, Justine, his little four-year-old uh, Wilson, little boy, is a really sweet little guy. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and by the way, you're going to see him more up front because he's going to be playing bass next week. He's a multi-talented man. He can fish and play the, the, the bass at the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe. so um, Talk to us about the process first, of, and then we'll talk more some, about some details of, of catching a fish. Sure, sure. Especially so, fly fishing. Yeah, so this is it. This is how you catch a fish, right? We start off fishing, we end catching. Um, and so if you think about it, it's, you have to take all these things in consideration. Um, it's not just as easy as showing up. <laughs> I wish it was. Um, but conditions, depending on the season, the, the light outside, the weather, um, and the conditions can change during the day. The flow of the water, it's pretty remarkable. And that will kind of say, well, based on the conditions, I've got to consider different gear. So I have four different types of rods that I fish with, depending on the weather and the conditions. And then the next thing is, all right, so I've connected those two dots. Now I've got to figure out how to tempt these entice, using the language yes. of today, out of their holes. Um, and so now I'll look at different fly types, and there's ways I go about that. It's observing what's around me, putting my hand in the water, looking at what's hatching sitting around watching the fish as they do their thing, if they're eating at the top or eating at the bottom, that informs me on what I need to pull out of my, my box here. Presentation, which we first service was a little rough, but uh, <laughs> presentation is all about how you throw the, 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 the actual line into the water. And then if you can make it through all that, Irish horsepower or good luck is probably <laughs> what you really need to start catching. So um, those are kind of the steps. Yeah, That's a good overview. So show us how this thing works. You know, I, I noticed that you don't have a button on there to push like those little uh, no. casting. This is, this is a little more complicated. Yep. You, you mentioned first service getting caught on the lights up there. Yeah. But sometimes awesome. that happens, right? It may be a tree branch or something or your ear or I've back of your that. head. I've done that. You've done it three times. I've, ear, calf, finger. And that's why I have medical grade forceps because every now and then you need those. That beats uh, driving out of your campsite for two hours to go to the hospital to get it removed from it, your calf, true story. which happened before. <laughs> so show us uh, a little bit how this thing works, and wh why do you go back and forth with it? He doesn't have a hook on this. I, I made yeah. sure because I don't want it right here in my ear. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to not do the full cast because okay. um, I don't want to build that type of momentum here. Um, but ba basically, you're just trying to feed this, this line out. And if you look, I've got a little... I have a, what I call a hopper on the end of that. It's a little grasshopper pattern. And so... The line, the line, is the line weighted some? Yes. Okay. So this is a weighted line. The green line is weighted. Um, the tippet, which is the clear line, is not. And so you've got to build momentum because these things don't weigh a lot. Okay. So you have to really do that. To so the, the casting is just to get it right in the right spot Correct. where you want it. It's not so much to make it look like it's actual fly landing. That's... If That's you're really good, you can do that, Okay. Right? Cool. <laughs> So you talked about studying the fish. Like, uh, 
Do you ever just like find a fish in the river? You Absolutely. do mostly river or lake? I do both, but I prefer river. Okay. I like standing out in the middle of a river and it's kind of nice and yeah. a little dangerous. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I always spot, I think my glass is here somewhere. Polarized glasses, fisherman's best friend. Um, typically I'll stand and look for fish, right? Uh-huh. Before I even approach them. And then I figure out where my shadows get to land and all those kind of things. But yeah. I so there's a, there's a study that goes into not only finding it, if you're going to actually go after one, mm-hmm. but trying to figure out what, what bait you're going to use. Oh, absolutely. So let me, let me set this yeah. down for a second. Um, and I'll show you. I think this is the box I want to show. So I have two boxes because you never know. Um, you tie these things too. I do tie time. them and it takes me about 20 minutes. So I'm not that good at it, but it sounds pretty fast <laughs> to me. Um, well, it's complicated. If you look here in this box, there's a whole representation of what you might fish. And so I have dry flies, which basically float on the top. I have wet flies, which drag on the bottom and they have funny names like the, the copper John or my favorite one, the fringy. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we have, that's, that's a little one. there. Yeah. It's a real little rainbow warrior. We have the woolly bugger. Um, and so going back to that, the, the, you know, what I have to consider, sometimes I'll fish the tiniest thing in my box. Sometimes I'll fish the biggest thing in my box. And sometimes I'll fish a combination. Because sometimes they're hungry and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're hungry for something different than yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And so this thing called match the hatch. You want to match what they're trying to eat. Um, what I like to do is throw a big meaty hopper on the top, something that floats and gets their attention. And then I put a little tiny one on the back end of that. So the fish go, oh, I got to have it. I got it. And then this little thing comes by and they get that. So huh. that's how I entice and try to pull them out of their holes. Okay. Doesn't work all the time. You ever catch one on, the, on both hooks? I've done that once I Catch twice. two at one time? I've done it. Yes. <laughs> I've actually caught a fish with a fish. Like really? I've, I've had a little rainbow on and a brown came and grabbed the fish. I was like, that's a nice one. That's a good story to tell. And you pulled him all the way in, just him, him hanging on I the other did. fish? I did, yeah, yeah. I was like, man, you were Two hungry, for one dude. special there. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. That's awesome. So the, the, there's, there's a study. I just keep hearing there's study that goes into this. I, I was talking to uh, another guy that was here on Thursday night doing what you're doing with me. And uh, he, he, I didn't know this. He said sometimes they're not interested, so I'll just... You know, I see one I want, and I'll just ni- keep knocking him on the nose yep. until it, it bothers him, and then he just bites it to get rid of it, and yeah. boom, you got him. Oh, yeah, you can just, you can anger them into uh, temptation and enticing them into your net. Like, <laughs> I, you know, sometimes getting hit in the face will make you do radical things, so yeah. <laughs> so you've got, I thought this was pretty cool. Yep. You put a little um, magnet on there for yep. your your net yeah and you have to have your collegiate sticker on there too to show your affiliation roll tide anyway um, <laughs> but yeah so uh, i think dallas would appreciate that uh but yeah so uh this is a great thing you know you've you got that big long rod and you've got to have all your equipment close to you so you can just reach in and snag them and i catch and release every now and then i'll i'll fillet one and but most of the time catch and release and you said uh, one day just just in the morning you got with that big that big yeah, brown, how many did you get? Caught 27 brown trout last September, two Septembers ago now. Uh, they like to spawn that time of year, and they'll hit anything, so it wasn't really that I was that good. Uh, but it's kind of interesting because talking about conditions changing, the conditions changed during that whole day. And so I started with a woolly bugger. I ended with a hopper and caught 27. I was like, I'm done at noon. I was like, I got to go. Man, that's good. I'm going to go fishing with you. Please do. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank, thank you, man. You, thank you. Give my hand. Here's what I want you to hear. The enemy has been fishing for souls longer than any expert fisherman. And he is sophisticated, and he studies his prey, and he adapts his lures. And uh, and I want you to see this in the text. Temptation always follows the same process. Step one, the bait is dropped. And we're going to apply this to ourselves, but think about a fish minding his own business, Safe, casual, doing whatever fish do, thinking whatever fish think. And all of a sudden, the bait is dropped, and he notices it. Maybe he's not hungry, or maybe he's hungry for a different kind of food. Maybe he just ignores it. If so, he's not in danger. Same is true for you. The bait is dropped. Step two. You desire it. Now, perhaps the fish is hungry, and it looks like a tasty morsel there. He says, wow, that looks great. But just because 
the bait is attractive. He's still safe if he doesn't bite it. Now you think about this. Just because you have a desire or an attraction to something, that is not sin. It's not sin to be tempted. We all have bait dropped in front of us on a regular basis, and we have the choice of ignoring it and moving on or going after it. Sin hasn't happened yet in step two. That happens in step three. Sin occurs when you bite the bait. The fish doesn't know there's a hook hiding in that nicely little tide fly. And as soon as he bites down, if it's an expert fisherman like Billy, he sets the hook and boom. Now maybe he's going to get released, but maybe he's going to get filleted. <laughs> now a classic example of this is the story of King David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11. The first verse says that David, at the time when all the kings go to war with their men, stayed home and sent his men to war. That's the first problem. He was not where he should be with his men in community, but rather in isolation and alone. And that's where we get ourselves into trouble sometimes. In this case, he's walking on his palace roof, king's palace, higher than all the other houses around. And many people used their flat roofs in those days as like a deck. And he looks down and he sees a woman who is bathing on a rooftop, rooftop nearby. Apparently, she's oblivious to the fact that she can be spotted. She's not trying to seduce the king. And it, the text says he noticed she was very beautiful. Now, to glance at her is not a sin. To notice that she's very beautiful is not a sin. God created many beautiful creatures on this planet. And I think a lot of us guys would say women are right up at the top of the list. And there's nothing sinful about admiring beauty. David could have resisted temptation at that moment. Like Joseph did in Genesis 39. When his master's wife, in privacy of the home with the master gone, repeatedly and aggressively tried to seduce him. She was not very subtle, by the way, about how she dropped the bait. If you go back and read that story, it says... She finally grabbed him and said, come to bed with me. Nothing too uh, subtle about that. <laughs> so what happened? He made a snap decision and ran. Pastor Hollis often says something that, uh, that resonates with me that is uh, of such value, and that is the importance of making a decision before a decision about a decision. That's good. That is apparently what Joseph had already done. Otherwise, it might have ended differently. He didn't say, hang on, let me think about that. Hmm. Let me do a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> There's a name for people who linger in debate with temptation. Victim. King David, on the other hand, although he was a man after God's own heart, God called him that, in a moment of weakness and vulnerability, he allowed a glance to become a gaze. And he allowed his natural desire to become sustained lust. And suddenly he had to have her. He sent his guards to bring her to his chamber. And that resulted not only in adultery, but eventually in murder to try to cover it up. Which is a story that is a textbook example of James 1, 13 to 15, the slippery slope of sin. It starts with temptation. Once you bite the bait, step number four, the end is tragic to one degree or another. The fish ends up hooked and sometimes cleaned, flayed, fried. James switches metaphors from fishing to conception, birth, and death. He says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. We're looking at sin's pro process, and conception, in the words of this text, happens when there is a joining of the inner desire with the external bait, and then quickly, sin is birthed. And after sin is born, instead of the exciting and enjoyable benefits the, that were anticipated, there's going to be some kind of death-like result, either quickly or eventually. Dark consequences, guilt, shame, remorse. 
And if the sin is repeated over and over and over and over, the same sin, the darkness of addiction may result. I think if we're going to have better success in resisting temptation, we would do well to spend more time and you know, greater thought on what the consequences of sin are rather than the fleeting pleasure. A survey was done uh, by Discipleship Journal, and it was of believers, and, and they were asked to rank the areas of greatest spiritual challenge to them. And here's what they voted, or they um, indicated, were the top nine. Number one, materialism. By the way, this was a survey done in America. And while you can also be um, affected by materialism if you have nothing, it's a, it's a bit much bigger temptation in our country than many countries of the world. Second was pride, and then self-centeredness, laziness, tied, five and six are a tie between anger and bitterness and sexual lust, envy, gluttony, lying. Now, this, these aren't the only sins. We could make a list probably of 100. But I think we could all probably find at least one, if not many, on this list that are a challenge for us. So how do we deal with it? Here's something important also from the survey. Respondents noticed that temptations were more potent when they neglected their time with God and when they were physically tired. In other words, be watchful, they indicated in the survey, resisting temptation was accomplished by prayer, avoiding compromising situations, Bible study, and being accountable to someone. So let's look briefly at how to face temptation. We're going to look at a couple other verses because uh, in the passage we read in James, it's talking about what temptation is in the process of, of temptation becoming sin more than how to resist it. Okay? Number one, draw near to God. James later in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Now I think sometimes it might be easy for us glibly to quote this and just say, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So all you got to do is just resist the devil. But notice carefully what comes before and after that exhortation intentionally as God inspired this for his word. It says, first, submit to God. And then after, it says, come near to God, and he'll come near to you. You see, God is much more powerful than Satan. But Satan is much more powerful than you in your own strength. And he's a roaring lion seeking someone to, de to devour. And so our only hope is to draw near to God, to be in close relationship with the Lord. Jesus told his disciples... To watch and pray so that you fall, do not fall into temptation because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. What's he saying? He's saying watch out. Be prayerful. Stay connected to me. The devil will flee from you when you face him in the power of the Lord. Not in your own strength. Amen? In fact, in another place it says greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's why we've got to depend on the Holy Spirit's power. Number two, fill your head and heart with scripture. Jesus modeled this for us. Every time the enemy came to him with the temptation, he quoted scripture that he had memorized already back at the enemy. And in, and in Matthew 4, he, he does this over and over. He starts with, it is written. And then he, he says the word, it is written. It is written. See, Jesus is modeling for us that there is power in God's word. Do you believe that? Ephesians 6, there's this whole list of, of Roman armor, armor that we can put on to, you know, defend ourselves against the devil. And, and is, as you read down through the list, it's all um, offensive, or excuse me, it's all defensive except for one element. There's, there's the helmet that's for, you know, defending your head, the breastplate, defending your heart. But there's one weapon in the list, or one piece of armor that is offensive, and it's the sword. You see it uh, there at, in uh, Ephesians 6, 17. It says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You can use God's Word as an offensive weapon against the enemy, just like Jesus did in the wilderness. Um, I got a sword here that I keep in my office. 
just in case. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's actually on a stand, and, it's on a pl- and there's a plaque on the stand that it, it has a quote from Hebrews 4, verse 12, which talks about the word of God being sharp as a two-edged sword. It can pierce even to the marrow in the bone. What's it talking about? Well, it's talking about this right here. This is a Roman gladius, it's called. It's really heavy. And um, this one is, is very sharp on the point, which makes it dangerous. It's not sharp here just because it hasn't been sharpened. But the Roman soldiers, they learned that this was a wonderful fighting tool because they could get really up cl- They could still use it when they were up close. Long swords, they couldn't. And long swords were mostly for swinging. This could also be for thrusting. And that's how they used it. It's not pretty to think about, but that's what, what happened. And they could, if they, if they put this in somebody's gut, they were very likely to bleed out and die. And it, if they it, you know, swung it, they could chop off stuff <laughs> at close range. <laughs> and so it was a very effective tool in, in warfare, the Roman gladius. And this is what the Bible is talking about as a metaphor For the word of God, the word of God is a powerful sword that you can go on the offensive with against the enemy. That's why it is so important for us to store our head and heart with the scriptures. Does that make sense? Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the collection of 150 psalms. And... One thing you notice as you read through it is a lot of, it's all about the Word of God. And, it, and many times it says that we are to meditate on God's Word. That means to, to reflect, to think deeply, and to apply it to our life. And one of the benefits of that is an aid in resisting temptation. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your heart, word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, in order to be successful in resisting temptation, we've got to stay close to the Lord Fill our head and heart with his word. And when necessary, number three, look for a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is what? (laughs) Say it with me. Faithful. That is so encouraging. God is faithful. Tell yourself that. Believe that. You can trust him. He will never let you down. He is faithful. It goes on to say, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He will provide a way of escape, some translations say. Maybe that means you have to run like Joseph and just get the heck out of Dodge. But God is trying to provide you a way out when you're tempted. Look for it. What is that way of escape? Maybe it means shifting your thoughts. Or leaving a place. Look for that way of escape. And he will reveal it to you. Number four, realize that sin gets crowded out easier than pushed out. And by that I mean crowded out by God and his spirit rather than pushed out by my own effort. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you go on there and continue reading in chapter 5, there are two lists. They're, the works of the flesh are contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit. And there's this list, the works of the flesh, it's all of this evil behavior. And then the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, self-control, patience, so on, is beautiful. It's like a Christ-like character is the fruit of the Spirit if we cooperate. But, but we've got these two worlds that we have to choose which world we're living in. And if you concentrate on sin and just try to avoid it, You'll be less successful than if you concentrate on the Lord and learning to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and letting him fill your life with good fruit, the the fruit of the Spirit, which will will crowd out the flesh. You see, sin gets crowded out by God easier than it gets pushed out by me. Outside of our master bedroom at our house, we have a a door that walks out to a little patio that uh, with a little arbor over it that I built, and, and on that we've planted... Grapevines, and they get big clusters of grape this time of year, and if we don't get them off, they fall off, and the dogs start eating them. And, but uh, the, the grape leaves are big, and they stay green even after the grapes are gone for a while. 
But as the weather's changing, and we had a dramatic example of it this week, for sure, um, eventually those leaves aren't green anymore. They turn brown and they get all crumbly and they die and they blow away with the wind. You know, I've noticed something over the years. Every year the same thing happens. Most of the leaves blow away, but there'll be a, a couple leaves that although they are dead, they just hang on tenaciously. Even when there's strong winds, even when there is, you know, strong snow, sure enough, still got a dead leaf hanging on to that vine. But here's what happens in the spring. Every spring, same thing happens. When the temperature warms and the sap begins to travel up into those vines, the new growth gradually but always successfully crowds the dead leaf off the vine and there's new life. You see, that's how it is with us. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You can do nothing with, apart from me if you're disconnected. But if you're connected, you can bear good fruit and much fruit. Stay connected. And the sap of the Holy Spirit through your connection with the Lord will do a work in your life if you cooperate where sin gets crowded out. Focus on walking in the Spirit. And if you do, the text says you will not gratify the flesh, the desires and lusts of the flesh. One more. Don't journey alone. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says, Two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. We all need community. We need each other. We need brothers and sisters that we trust in our lives. We need to support each other, hold each other uh, accountable. <clears throat> a man and his wife were shopping at a mall kiosk. And a shapely young woman in a, a short, form-fitting dress, high heels, strolled by, and the man's eyes followed her. Without looking up from the item she was examining, his wife asked, was it worth the trouble you're in? <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, all three services, it just seemed like there was more of a feminine laughter. <laughs> Did you notice that? That's one form of accountability, I suppose. But listen, temptation is not nagged or policed away most effectively. But when we're able to share our struggles with someone we trust and pray and, and, and support each other, it makes a difference. Don't try to grow spiritually in isolation all the time. There's a place for solitude, but not isolation from brothers and sisters. Don't journey alone. We're going to close our service a little different today with a special communion experience. And I invite you to allow this time. Don't be in a hurry to go, please, okay? I, I, I want you, I want to encourage you to allow this to be a time of sincere reflection, repentance, and rededication. Pastor Kelly is going to come set up communion. And while she does, I invite you to look at the screen. And to make this a prayer of preparation. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting.